Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people have been learning about their ancestors. From kings to thieves, inventors to farmers, nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore, but it always does. Find out what we mean. Great family history stories and information are on the way now with Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. It's been this way for generations. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. Uh oh. And welcome back, Genies. It's Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com, where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. Hi, it's Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, and we want to welcome some great radio stations to our growing family of affiliates. Fox News KZNU 93.1 FM and 1450 AM in St. George, Utah, and in Cedar City, Utah, KENT AM and FM. We're excited to be part of Carl Lamar's outstanding lineup in Southern Utah. We've got a couple of great guests today. First, in about 10 minutes, Stan Lindis of Heritage Consulting is back. He is our research authority. And and even though Stan is a professional researcher, just like you and me, he has in his lines brick walls. That's where, of course, you just can't seem to find the records to push a line back any further. He'll share one remarkable experience about breaking down one of his walls and give you some advice that may make all the difference. Then later in the show, a listener named Blair Pullman called our Extreme Genes fine line to fill us in on the successful conclusion to a hunt for a grandfather that spanned over six decades. Yeah, his father started looking for his dad in the early 50s, and Blair carried on the search, only recently breaking down the wall and finding his man. I think you'll find it intriguing to hear the lengths Blair went to and what happened along the way, including a U-turn or two before his case was finally cracked. If you have a story you'd like to share or a question or comment, just call our toll-free Extreme Jeans Fine Line at 1-234-56-JEANS. That's 1-234-56-JEANS, G-E-N-E-S. We really love hearing what you're up to. Our ExtremeJeans.com poll from last week shows 63% say, yes, they have a proven line to royalty. They voted, yes, bow to me. 37% voted, no. I'm just a commoner. So thanks for voting. Our poll for this week asks, is there an ancestor on your tree whose story is so incredible it makes you wonder if it could possibly be true? Now, I have a few like that. You can vote now at ExtremeGenes.com, and we'll share the results next week. And by the way, if you'd like to tell us about one of those ancestors, drop me a line at Fisher at ExtremeGenes.com. Here is this week's family histoire news from the pages of ExtremeGenes.com. Think of it as your drudge report for family history news. We start out with this from Discovery.com. It now seems possible, if not likely, that Hitler married a Jewish woman. We all know that Eva Braun was Hitler's longtime lover who he married in the bunker in Berlin in 1945, just before their dual suicide by cyanide capsules. When the war ended, an American Army intelligence officer brought home a little souvenir from Hitler's Alpine home in Bavaria, a hairbrush with the initials E.B. The brush was purchased by a man named Mark Evans for $2,000. Evans is a British TV host on Channel 4 there who has a series called Dead Famous DNA. Well, of course, there were hairs still in that brush, and Evans had a DNA analysis done. What did he find? The person who presumably owned the brush belonged to the N1B1 Haplo group. One group is particularly well associated with N1B1, Ashkenazi Jews, who compromise about 80% of the Jewish population throughout the world. Ava met Adolf in 1929, but the future dictator was concerned that having a relationship might somehow sully his image. So he had her quietly kept, basically, at the home in Bavaria. Many of the Ashkenazi Jews became Catholics in the mid-19th century, and so despite Hitler's background check into Ava's Aryan purity, Evans says it's unlikely he ever would have known his mistress was Jewish. 
A pair of surviving female relatives of Ava Braun refused to provide a DNA sample to compare to what was found in the hair on the brush, so the result can only be called inconclusive, but certainly intriguing. The story was written by Rosella Lorenzi. Read the full article at ExtremeGenes.com. Next, SmithsonianMag.com tells us that just south of the Arch in St. Louis is an overpass. And it's there that the Missouri Department of Transportation is planning major highway construction. Now, before any of that can happen, of course, the National Historic Preservation Act requires that archaeologists review the site. In this case, the result of that inspection was the discovery of remains of a French settlement dating back 250 years. It was thought that nothing was left of the settlement until this find, which includes the remnants of a home that records tell them was built in 1769 by a man named Joseph Bouchard. Now, we're not talking about a lot, a piece of a ceramic bowl, and some post holes so far, but the archaeologists are more than thrilled. We're talking about the first physical evidence of a settlement that lasted for 40 years before the Louisiana Purchase and a home that was built only five years after the settlement of St. Louis as a fur trading post in 1764. If you had French ancestors in that area, you may take special interest in seeing these finds soon on special display in a museum below the St. Louis Arch. The Washington Post reports that an alumnus of Virginia Military Institute has been tracing down descendants of VMI cadets who served in the Battle of Newmarket for the Confederacy in the Civil War. The 150th anniversary is in May, and VMI alum Ken Dice took it upon himself to use his genealogical researching skills to track down as many living descendants of these soldiers as possible. In 1864, 257 VMI cadets reinforced battered Confederate troops and turned what looked like a Union victory in the Battle of Newmarket into a win for the South. Ten of their number died in the battle. VMI will be performing a reenactment next month for the anniversary, and all the living descendants Dice has found, over a thousand, have been invited to attend, with 177 accepting the invitation. Interestingly, 20 are themselves VMI alumni, two more are currently enrolled there, and three have more than one ancestor who fought at Newmarket. Wouldn't that be a fascinating call to get? Hi, did you know you're a descendant of so-and-so and and that he fought in this battle in the Civil War? I mean, we should all be so fortunate. Find the link to this and all this week's stories at ExtremeGenes.com. And coming up next, he's our research authority, Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com. If you're having trouble breaking down your brick wall, wait till you hear what happened to him with his brick wall and the great advice he's got for you. It could make all the difference. It's coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. Your priceless 8mm home movies and your precious family videos are deteriorating right now. Heat, moisture, insects, dust, mold, time, they're all robbing you of your family's memories. It's time to preserve those treasures right now by digitizing them at tmcplace.com. They've been preserving memories for over 40 years. Home movies, videos, audio tapes, vinyl records, photos, slides, and even scrapbooks. Whether your treasures are enduring the humidity of Massachusetts or the heat of Arizona, tmcplace.com can digitize your audio and images without harming the originals and returning them to you with free shipping both ways on most orders. tmcplace.com can even let you track your package in real time with a special GPS tracking device. Trustworthy, experienced, affordable. Call tmcplace.com toll-free at 1-866-483-1717 to talk to Extreme Genes Preservation Authority Tom Perry about your project or order online at shop.tmcplace.com. You know, when it comes to family history, there's nothing quite like the thrill of the hunt and the excitement generated by every new discovery. Who were your immigrant ancestors? What ship did they come over on? Why did they come when they did? Did they participate in any military campaigns that took place in their day? What personal challenges did your forefathers and mothers endure? Heritage Consulting, genealogy research services can get you the answers to many of these questions and more. They've been providing professional research and consultation services since 1970. Call toll-free 1-877-537-2000 to speak directly to a professional family history researcher. Heritage Consulting can research, collect, 
analyze, and interpret the countless documents your ancestors generated throughout their lives and present the findings to you in an attractive book or in an electronic format. The cost? Far less than you'd expect for far more than you can imagine. 877-537-2000 or go to heritageconsulting.com. Welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here with Stan Lindis, our research authority from HeritageConsulting.com. Welcome back, Stan. Hey, Fish. It's always fun to be with you. Always fun. And, of course, one of the keys to research and why you professionals exist is because so many of us run into what they call the brick wall. You just can't get behind it. There, You, you put the sledgehammer to it, nothing budges, and then finally something happens, the little linchpin, and it comes tumbling down. And I thought we'd talk a little bit about some of these today. Some of them, of course, are just the result of bad records. Some of them are the result of people just wanting to disappear for various reasons. Yeah, uh, and you have to know that even professional genealogists have their own brick walls. Absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit about one of the brick walls that I had. All right. Who do you have? Who was I he? have a, a great-grandfather by the name of Alfred M. Botsford. He was out of Hartford, Connecticut. And ended up in northern Illinois, and he married my great-grandmother in northern Illinois, had a couple of children. Well, Alfred worked at a shoe factory in Rock Island, Illinois, and he was a hard-working man. He was just very diligent. He was at the plant late at night, and his wife thought that he needed to have dinner. So she packed up a lunch. What a nice wife. It, she was you know? very sweet and kind. And she went down to the shoe factory to give Alfred his meal. Well, she wandered around the shoe factory, and she finally found him in the storage room where they have shelves and shelves and shelves of shoes. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a library, right? Yeah, much, much like the bookshelves in the library. Yeah. And she found him. Well, Alfred was a very busy man. Mm-hmm. As was the young lady that he was with. <laughs> yeah, you got the idea. Uh-huh. Well... Um, Uh-oh. Mrs. Botsford discovered rather quickly that shelves of shoes could tumble just like dominoes. <laughs> and uh, the young lady and Alfred were buried in shoes. Ooh. Well, Alfred showed up at home um, not long after that, and his bags were packed and on the door stoop, and he was never heard of or from after that. Now, what era are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about the very early 1900s. and no one ever talked about him until my mother would sit in the attic with her grandmother, and there were chests of all kinds of memorabilia, among which were some letters and some pictures. And so grandma told my mother the story. Wow. That, and, that's kind of unusual, isn't it, though, well, for, for it anybody from that era? It was era. a painful story. Sure. It was a painful story. And in that day and time, secrets were important. Well, for years, I tried to find Alfred, find out what happened to him. I looked high and low, and one day while in the Family History Library in Salt Lake City working on a very boring project, I looked up, and there was a young friend of mine who was arranging the books on the shelves in the Family History Library. I walked over to visit with her just to take a break, and as I looked up, in front of me were three volumes of the Botsford Family History Organization. Yeah, it's a very well-known name back in Connecticut. Uh, it is. It's a very well-known name. And I had already looked at the first two volumes of this set, but I'd never seen the third volume. I pulled the third volume off. I flipped through it. Well, Alfred was a junior, so I already knew Dad's name was Alfred. I also had some idea of what his mother's maiden name was. And lo and behold, I found just enough information to link Alfred. This is after years and years of looking for him. Well, I made some quick notes. It was a beautifully footnoted book with a great bibliography, an index, everything. It well was documented. A, yes, it was a fabulous piece of work. Well, I went back to work, and it took another couple of weeks before I got to get back to dear Alfred. I went back to the shelf, and there was not a volume three on the shelf. Oh, no. Not only was there not a volume three, there was no space for a volume three. Yeah, it was strange. <laughs> I looked high and low for this book, and I went ahead and I took the notes that I had, and I went, and sure enough, I found Alfred based on the information. But the citations that were in the book 
never, ever existed. Excuse me? Okay. They, the book was footnoted. I took note of those footnotes, not to be too redundant, and then I went to look for those records which were in the footnotes. Those records never existed. The information. So was it fraudulent? Is that what you're saying? Or they just made it up? Well, I can't say, Fish, because over the next 20 years, I have looked for Volume 3. About 10 years ago, I contacted the Botsford Family History Organization. We have never published a Volume 3. Oh, that's interesting. So who do I complain to? You know, right. <laughs> I have no idea, but I'm not giving the information back. It got me onto the Botsfords. So brick walls can be torn down in the most bizarre way sometimes. And it doesn't mean, in my case, that it took a professional to do it. So this is something that we might call a little serendipity? Yes, and there are a lot of those. There are some publications where, with serendipitous experiences for genealogists that are great. And these things happen on a regular basis, not just to professionals, but to individuals. I've had them happen myself. There's no explaining it, Yeah, (laughs) but it's exciting when it does. And you don't give the information back. No, no. No. Once you got it, it's yours. That's right. That's right. And you save it and you go forward from there. So let's talk about breaking down the walls, because I think a lot of people get very frustrated because they feel it's not possible to get there. It's never going to be possible. In my mind, it's like, wait a minute. Things are changing very quickly. There's always something new coming out. Their perception, that very perception, is usually what the wall is built from. That's right. It's not that it can't be found, that there's not something out there. Yes, there are some instances wherein individuals have been on this earth and did not leave any sign or trace. But for most people, in the U.S. especially, and in Europe, and in the U.K., and Scandinavia, There is some record. Now, the farther back you go, the harder it is to do. But sometimes you have to just forget that notion that it is a brick wall. And what my advice to a lot of people is, instead of you looking at it, you who have built the brick wall, you sit down with someone who has never seen that material before. And you just give them the information about the specific problem. Don't clutter their minds with all the things that you have gathered and that you have in your mind. Let them look at it in a pure form, and I guarantee you they're going to come up with some ideas that you are going to go, oh, yeah, I should have thought of that. Well, a lot of times it's because you didn't think about it because of the clutter that you had. And you determine in your own mind this just wasn't possible right. to do. And, you know, I had this situation where for 30 years I couldn't find a set of third great grandparents. I had the wife's first name, and I had the husband's full name, and I could not find any man by that name who married a woman by that name. Right. And it went on and on. And finally, somebody accidentally, I think, attached the name of the husband into another branch. And I contacted that person and said, why do you think he belongs to this family? She said, I don't know. I just think he does, <laughs> which was, of course, ridiculous. Or and, serendipitous. Well, it was interesting because she didn't have any clue about it. She just thought it kind of fit there. I'm going, well, that's quite a ways away from where we are. and But it caused me to start and examine the whole thing all over again. Yeah. And I'd kind of given up on it. It's just like one of those things we would never get to. Well, as a result of the digitized newspapers over the last several years, I found an obituary of a man of that name who died at the right age and time to have been the father of my great-great-grandmother. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. Could this fit? Who's he buried with? Well, he wasn't buried with the woman I thought he should have been to prove it, but he was buried with a little girl who had turned out to be a first daughter of my great-grandmother, who I didn't know existed. So he helped me find the girl, and the girl validated that I'd found the right man. Right. And as a result, then, I was able to find another digitized newspaper account of a minister's marriage record that they published in 1886, and the record went back to the 18-teens and 20s, and there was the marriage record. And off we went. And that line eventually took me back to the Mayflower. So it was an amazing thing. And behind all these brick walls, there's a city. Oh, yes. And it goes on forever. These are still new people to me, and I'm having a ball with it. And you a lot of times have to just put it down and wait until the key, in this case, 
the assignment of the name that you were talking about to another family by this woman. And by the way, she was right. <laughs> yeah. And so you have to wait until the key is there for you to have access to it. And that key can be resources that are not available now, but may be available next week, five years from now, 10 years from now, or the technology to do this. So wait as hard as it is to do, put it down and wait a while. Have somebody else look at it. Have a professional researcher look at it. Go to a genealogical research facility and have one of the staff look at your problem. It's a way to start tearing down the brick wall. Change your perception about the end of the line problem. It's not a brick wall. It's just a greater adventure. And the reality is you and I have worked on our families for years and the portions of our pedigrees wherein we find generation after generation in a matter of a couple of hours. We don't know those people. The ones that we have to work and work and struggle, we know them almost to the most intimate level. We know these people and we remember them far better than you remember those that you got four generations instantly. So enjoy your quote unquote brick walls. Especially as it comes tumbling down. Great advice. Yes. Stan yeah. Lindis, our research authority from HeritageConsulting.com. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Fish. And coming up next, Blair Pullman. His father had started this search for his dad back in the early 1950s. And now Blair has finally broken down his brick wall. We'll tell you about that coming up next on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. a brick wall in your family tree? Don't know how to break through it? Get professional help from Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services. Speak directly with an experienced genealogical researcher, not a salesperson. By calling toll-free 1-877-537-2000. When you call, ask how you could win a free one-hour consultation with an expert genealogist. Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services. With over 35 years of research experience, visit heritageconsulting.com. Did you know your family's memories are being destroyed a little at a time every day? It's true. Old home movies, slides, photos, and audio recordings fade over time. The longer you delay the digitizing of these priceless artifacts, the more likely it is they'll be gone one day. That's why you need to call the Multimedia Center. I brought in VHS videotape and had them transferred to DVD. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Dot com. And welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And you know, we're always telling you, you got to call our toll free find line at 1 234 56 Genes to share your success stories because, you know, it encourages so many other people to pursue the impossible. And I think uh, this guy on the phone right now is an example of that. Blair Pullman, how are you? Welcome to the show. I'm doing well, thank you. You've been on the hunt for this. This is actually a multi-generational hunt for your father's birth father, as I understand it, right? That's correct. So your dad looked for him years back. Give us a little basic background here. Well, my father's mother met my father's birth father in Switzerland when she was being a nanny for a traveling British family. And they had gone to do the European tour thing, and they went to Switzerland and went to a hotel in Geneva, and that's where (laughs) grandmother met grandfather. And all we had from that encounter besides my dad <laughs> and his only his only uh, legacy from that was a picture and a name and the photograph was of walter rogan his birth father r-o-g-g-e-n okay and he is from where well he was swiss and that's about all we knew oh boy and the hotel was in geneva but that's what we learned that the family rogan is not from Oh, boy. In Switzerland, there are what they call citizenship books, that their citizenship in Switzerland was based on the town you were from, not from the country, but from the town. And so each town had its citizens, and if you, even if you went to another town to live, you were still a citizen of the original town. 
Okay. And the Rogan family, R-O-G-G-E-N, was from a town called Morton, which is on the line between French-speaking and German-speaking Switzerland. <laughs> which further complicates things. Right. It's between uh, Bern and Neuchâtel. And that town is only 6,000 people now. It's a small place. Its only historical significance was that back in the 1400s, the Swiss defeated Charles the Bold of Burgundy there. And so every June 21st, they have their celebration of that battle and they have parades and all that sort of thing. And people had their class reunions then. Anyway, I knew that much. I learned that much that Merton is the home base of the Rogan family. You are relentless to find out all that stuff. <laughs> Yes, and then now you that, got now, now you wound up though up a, a wrong tree at one point. Tell us about that. I did well. Let me just say that I got some a couple of family trees. I found online an article in German, which was not too hard to read though, about a Swiss yodeler from New Zealand who had come to compete in yodel contests in Switzerland, and he was originally from Merton. And so I had found his email address for his Swiss Kiwi Yodel group. <laughs> and yes, and wow. emailed him in New Zealand and said, do, do you happen to know about Walter Rogan? And he says, I happen to have a couple of family trees. And Walter Rogan's on the family tree. And so he and I thought that he and I have the same ancestry. Walter Rogan, born in Merton in 1872. You and the yodeler. And me and the yodeler. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but then I learned my sister had something that was an additional legacy from Grandpa. It was a postcard written from St. Petersburg, Russia, to Grandmother Holman in Holland, saying... I will send some money when I can, but I had a picture of a hotel in St. Petersburg, Russia on there. And I thought, uh-oh, there's a Russian connection. Uh-oh is right. Now what do you do? Where do you well, go with that? I looked some more internet searches for Rogan in Russia and found a marriage record of Walter Rogan in St. Petersburg to a lady named Fanny Rosenberger. Now, wait, 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 a, wait a minute. There are actual Russian records online now. I had no well, idea. They're actually translated from Russian into Swedish, and they were published in a <laughs> Federation of European, uh, Eastern European Family History Society newsletter. <laughs> and they're online now. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you talk about obscure records. <laughs> Look at you go. <laughs> well, you just do a lot of Internet searches. Yeah, you go where you got to go. Okay. Keep digging, and you find these things. And I looked at the side of one of the family trees, and off to the side of the main tree that Oscar Rogan is on and the Walter Rogan, there's another Walter Rogan on a little twig off to the side. And there's a Walter Rogan, also from Merton, Switzerland, born in 1873. And on that twig, his wife's name is listed as Fanny Rosenberg. And not Rosenberger, but Rosenberg. And so I thought, oh my. And at the bottom of the tree, there's a fellow named Beat Rene Rogan. And so another internet search. Uh-oh. <laughs> to find him, his address in Switzerland online in the telephone directory online directories and so i wrote to him an actual postal letter i wrote to Beat Rene rogan and sent him a copy of that picture of my grandfather and he essentially wrote back and said what are you doing with a picture of my grandfather oh! <laughs> victory <laughs> victory wow and so he and i have been corresponding since, and he sent me some information about the Rogan family in Russia, how the family had gone from Merton to Russia and had had a hotel there that they owned, and they had to leave at the, that shortly after the Russian Revolution of October 1917, lost the hotel, lost their money, lost everything, had to come back to Merton flat broke. You've got to be kidding me. What an amazing adventure. That is an adventure. Now that you, is an adventure. You were telling me that your father had actually started this search how long ago? Oh, 
not too long. <laughs> I guess probably back in about 1950 or so, and he was never, never able to find anything because the records were not that good for that part of Switzerland. Okay. However... Now there are, and I just happened to go online last year, census records for the canton of Freiburg in Switzerland, which includes Morton. Now they're not indexed, but you can search every name in that place through there and add up and, you know, get more names on your family line. And I did that, and I also through that I found another website called Genianet. Right. G E N E A, capital N E T, from Paris, France. But there's a man there, Patrick Grandidier, who had more of my family lying on it back into the late 1600s. I think it's about time you go back across the pond here, Blair. I think I'm taking a trip to Switzerland in a month or two <laughs> and see what I can find in the archives there to fill in some more of the story. Now, are you going back to meet your first cousin? I hope to do that. And where does he live now? He lives in a town called Nussbaumen by Baden, just outside of Zurich. Wow. And he's, but he's a traveling man, so he's often gone from home. I hope he'll be there when we're there. And who was the first guy you found? What was his occupation again? A yodeler. A yodeler. So what's happened to the yodeler? Is he out now? Is that what I understand? He's still in New Zealand. He, went, he, he, comes, from, he comes from New Zealand every couple of years to compete in yodel contest, contest <laughs> and then he and his group go back to New Zealand. So he's in New Zealand right now. But he is related. But he's, re- he's distantly related. Distantly. A very distant cousin. Right. Not as close as we first thought. I, I got you. But wow, what an adventure, Blair. And uh, what a fun thing to do. And congratulations on your success. It really does go to show that you never give it up, even after all these years from when your dad started, what, over 60 years ago. This is right. Absolutely. Great stuff. Thanks so much. Thank you. And coming up next, our Preservation Authority, Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, continuing the debate about the best way to store your data for the long term. He's going to tell you about the best disks and all about a brand new disk that's coming out soon. You're going to want to hear about it. It's coming up next on Extreme Genes, Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. Remember how fun it was to capture those special moments of your children's childhood on video and watch it back, knowing that you'd be able to have that memory forever? Or watching a home movie of your own childhood and seeing many of your loved ones who are now gone. If you haven't yet digitized those family treasures, you're at risk of losing all of them with each passing day. Time and elements slowly destroy videos and film, as well as rare old photos and audio recordings. Rescuing your memories is what TMCPlace.com has been doing for over 40 years. They can transfer all these disks and hard drives so you and your family can enjoy them digitally for generations to come and without damaging the originals. They provide free shipping both ways on most orders. They even offer GPS real-time tracking of your package so you can be confident that nothing can ever be lost in transit. Call toll-free 1-866-483-1717 to talk to Extreme Genes Preservation Authority Tom Perry about your special project or order online at shop.tmcplace.com. How's your family history research going? Are you stuck on a difficult line? Don't know how to start? Let the professionals at Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services help. Heritage Consulting has been providing professional research and consultation services since 1978. They can help you find your own personal family history for far less than you would expect by researching, collecting, analyzing, and interpreting the numerous historical documents your ancestors left in their lifetime. They'll then provide you with a professionally written report in book or electronic form that you and your family can enjoy for literally generations. Knowledge of your ancestors forges stronger ties within your family and helps children better appreciate who they are within the context of your family history. Call Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services right now. The call is free. Dial 1-877-537-2000. That's 1-877-537-2000. You'll speak directly to an expert genealogist. Find out more at Heritage Consulting com
and welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. I am your congenial host, Fisher, with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He is our preservation authority. And uh, Tom, last week you, you caused a little hornet's nest for people talking about <laughs> how we store data the right way. And uh, making sure that it's permanent. It lasts. Absolutely. We did get a note from a lady in Des Moines who wishes to remain nameless. She says, I'm kind of computer illiterate. What do I do? What's the best kind of drive to use to back up my stuff? Okay, I'm sure everybody has their own opinions out there. What I like to use, what I've been very successful with, the only kind of drives I personally use is either a Western Digital or a Lassie. And some people say, well, didn't Western Digital buy Seagate? Yes, they did buy Seagate, but I still won't use Seagate drives. In all the years that we've been archiving hard drives for people, I have never had a Western Digital fail. I've never had a LSE fail. They're not perfect. They will fail, like other ones, but our track record with them is amazing. LSE are by far the best. They're the most expensive. And you can get a lot of them, like Western Digital actually comes with backup software. It's pretty much plug and play. You can be totally computer illiterate. Plug the hard drive in. It will come up and ask you if you want to make this as your backup drive. It'll ask you a few questions. It's very intuitive. Just say yes, 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 and it becomes your backup drive. If you want something a little bit higher for those who are a little bit more into computers, at Digistores, which is spelled D-I-G-I-S-T-O-R-S, Rewind software is really, really good. You can use that for archiving video, film, just about anything you want for the people that are higher end. So hopefully that answered your question. Well, Tom, a lot of feedback from last week also centered around your comment about CDs not going away. This is kind of the commonly understood thing that technology is constantly changing, and what we had yesterday goes away tomorrow, and it's replaced by something else. You want to further explain that? Oh, absolutely. It's just like my dad used to have a 1928 Model A Ford pickup. It's a little bit different than an F-150 today, but they're still vehicles. They still come along the same way. Just because something's a disc doesn't mean it's all going to go away. You need to look at your disc as different sizes of boxes, like a CD is a small box, a DVD is a medium box, and a Blu-ray is a pretty good-sized box. And that Blu-ray box, not only is it bigger, it's stronger. It's made out of better quality materials. So the best way that a lot of people are doing is they're going to Blu-ray storage now. Because a lot of people say, oh, the cloud's the future, the cloud's the future, that's all we'll need. Well, not necessarily. The cloud can get full. And the more stuff you have on there, the more it's going to start costing you a month. So most of your big places are actually using Blu-ray. In fact, it's really interesting that Facebook is backing up all their stuff on Blu-ray format because of the cost savings, the durability, and the reliability. Blu-ray is the future. There's no question about it. Even though there's other stuff out there, Blu-ray is wonderful. In fact, next summer, they're coming out with a new archival Blu-ray DVD, which Sony and Panasonic did a joint venture that is going to be capable of holding an entire terabyte of oh information. Gosh on a Blu-ray disc. Wow. Is it possible then the cloud will become too expensive and won't be really worthy anymore? Well, it's kind of hard to predict that. My crystal ball has kind of been in the shop for a few weeks. However, I think all of these different parts are important. I think you need all these things to work. But the cloud does have an end to it. In fact, some of our sponsors and some of the people that have been on this show are getting into cloud-based applications and things too. So you have to kind of pick out which cloud you want, but don't rely on everything. You don't have control over the cloud. If the cloud goes down or something weird happens and you lose it right when you need it, it's not doing you any good. If you've got a fireproof safe or a gun safe that's got some Blu-ray discs in it, at any time if the cloud goes down, go to your safe, pull it out, you know, load it up, and there's your information. It's going to be a little bit harder to get to than just instantly on your computer but it's in your safe when you need it. You really have to think about this as data insurance, don't you? Perfect. That's a perfect scenario. Because can you really afford to lose this stuff? And if you can't, then you ought to pay for it now because, again, you're going to pay for it later. Exactly. All right, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. And what are we going to talk about, Tom? Some newer Blu-rays. Ooh, we'll find out what he's talking about coming up next on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. 
And welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, our preservation authority. And Tom, I so appreciate what you're talking about here because so many of us struggle with technology, even if we think that we're pretty good at this stuff. Most of us are beginners or intermediates. I'd say maybe I'm an intermediate. So this explanation of the various disks being similar to various size boxes is very helpful. And now you say Blu-ray has the next big thing? Right. It's kind of like the old Russian dolls. They just get yeah. adopted. They get smaller and bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> and that's what's neat about Blu-ray. Basically, CDs are 700 megabytes. DVDs are 4.7 gigabytes. And then, as we talked about, the new quartz discs that are coming out will be 365 terabytes. Well, who would ever fill one of those? I don't know. You look back in the old days. I remember when I had my first Mac. It was a 128K. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. I can put all my school stuff on this. 128K. Right. And I remember recently my one terabyte backup ran out of backup space. I had to get it too. Really? What did you have on that? A lot of customer stuff and a lot of my own stuff. And every night I put it in the fireproof safe. But they just get bigger and bigger. And that's one neat thing about Blu-ray is Blu-ray has ability to put more stuff on it as they get more technology. They can stay with the good qualities of Blu-ray disc, but put more information on them. For instance, Facebook, which we were talking about earlier, they have 10,000 discs with all added together. It's what they call a petabyte of data, which is a whole lot of data. Yes. And you would think, what would you need more than that? A couple hundred years from now, century from now, who knows what your storage needs are going to be. So it's really important to understand that. Like right now, most of Blu-rays, you can get them in 25 gigabyte to 50 gigabyte varieties. And Sony and Panasonic in a joint venture is going to release in the summer of 2015, so just about a year from now, a new Blu-ray that's going to hold a whole lot more information. In fact, it's more set up as an archive. That's what you need to remember. These Blu-ray discs are archived. You're not going to be working on it every day like you do off your hard drive. This is your backup. If your hard drive goes down, the cloud goes out, you've got your Blu-ray disc you can go back to. How expensive are these things? I don't really know what they're going to be. Anything when it first comes out, it's really pricey and drops down. And I think Sony has really learned a lot from past mistakes and coming out with something at too high of a price point. So when this new one terabyte Blu-ray comes out, you know, that's where you want to store your stuff. I'm going to do the same thing. I'll store stuff to it every night, put it in a a fireproof safe, take one home with me. So I've always got it. Send one to the East Coast, send one to the West Coast, so you're covered. But a terabyte on one disc is a lot of storage. Yes. That's what anybody would need. I think the average person, a terabyte, would take care of most everything from your lifetime. Oh, it is. It absolutely will. In fact, we have customers that come into our store and come back five years later. Do you still have my DVD? Do you still have a backup of my CD? Because my dog ate it. Seriously, that's not a joke. I had somebody call last week that their dog ate their CD. (laughs) But with this new Blu-ray and this new Quartz technology coming out, we will be able to store every client's CD, DVD, Blu-ray, whatever comes in the front door and have it as an archive, so when they need more, we can get it. There'll be a charge because we'll have to go back, extract it, and reinterpolate it to a Blu-ray, DVD, or CD, whatever they need. But, you know, just a year from now, we'll be able to have every client from that point forwards stuff kept forever. So discs are not going away, I promise. All right. We'll remember that, Tom. (laughs) We'll hang you in effigy if they are. That's right. Go right ahead. (laughs) And if you have a question you'd like Tom to answer, just drop an email to asktom at tmcplace.com. And you just may have your question answered on the show. Thanks to Blair Pullman for calling our Extreme Genes Fine Line with his remarkable story about the successful conclusion to a six-decade quest to identify his grandfather. It shows you should never give up. New stuff is coming out all the time. And if you have a great story of discovery or questions, comments, we'd love to hear them. Once again, our Extreme Genes Fine Line is toll-free 1-234-56-GENES. Include your contact information and we'll get back to you. And thanks also to our research authority, Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com for his thoughts on breaking down those brick walls. And boy, did he have an amazing story stuck in there. Hear the show again and catch up on our past shows by searching Extreme Genes iHeart, Extreme Genes iTunes, or just find the link at ExtremeGenes.com. Talk to you next week, and remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 